All right, I think we have a pretty good number and we're about three or four minutes in. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. So once again, welcome everyone, um, wherever you are around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, um, good night, <laughs> if you're joining us in, in the earlier or late hours. Um, welcome to this panel discussion. We are really excited. So today we'll be talking about um, from fellowship to leadership, uh, women in engineering for sustainable development. Uh, so for our panel today, we'll really be focusing in on and hearing from our panelists uh, about how they got to their current role, some challenges and opportunities that are that they face and some particular to women and how all genders can work together to, to ease these challenges um, and understanding some of their perspectives on leadership. Um, first off, a little bit of uh, housekeeping and, and just kind of getting warmed up. Um, as you're joining in, just go ahead and type in the chat uh, where you're from um, and or where you are currently, either one, um, just so we can have a sense of, of who we're talking to here. Um, it's early here in, in the US on the East Coast, but we really wanted to speak to our community in Africa and Asia um, and, and Europe as well. So just let us know where you are. Got Cameroon also, uh, Cameroon also Kenya. Netherlands. Ghana. There we go. All right. Australia. Great. This is what we were hoping, bringing in all the sides of the world. Sweden. Well, great. Keep, feel free to keep dropping those in. Um, but we will get into the, the meat of our, our discussion today. Um, so before we move on to chatting with our presenters, I would hand it off to my colleague and co-moderator, uh, Francisco, to talk a little bit about engineering for change. So Francisco, take it away. So yeah, thanks, Elia, and welcome everyone. We're so excited to finally be able to speak to our audience in Europe, Asia, Africa. It's a little bit early for us, but we have some good news. The chat is now enabled, so feel free to use it as, as, as you need. And I'm excited to see everybody joining. I'm, I'm calling from Ecuador in South America. It's 4 a.m. here. And yeah, so before we get started, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Francisco Plaza and I'm a junior program specialist at Engineering for Change. And I oversee our marketing and internal operations. And I also support implementing some specific impact services, mostly focused on entrepreneurship and innovation. I am a mechanical engineer by training and I also was an Engineering for Change fellow in 2021. So, uh, before we move on to, on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you about uh, a bit about Engineering for Change, or E4C for, e for short, as we like to call it. So Engineering for Change is a nonprofit organization dedicated to preparing, educating, and activating the international technical workforce worldwide to improve the quality of life of people on the planet. And the way we do this is by believing and cultivating in the next generation of change makers by providing them knowledge and training opportunities, as well as access to expertise. Uh, overall, what we look is to infuse engineering into sustainable development worldwide at every level, at every organization. And that is what we strive daily for. So, how we do mobilize our technical talent. At Engineering for Change, we have a proven model for understanding the critical design implementation and research needs of social impact organizations, which can be addressed by the diverse technical talent in the D4C community. Uh, and, with and with technical talent, we refer to more than just engineers. We look and encourage for diverse backgrounds and perspectives. And as a quick example, uh, we do have active projects in the architecture space. And during our fellowship, we encourage that type of interactions between uh, you know, engineers and architects as part of our daily work. So about uh, the project we host. So we work with diverse organizations ranging from academic institutions to social enterprises, private sectors, multilateral agencies. And we co-design uh, to define uh, what we call impact projects. 
where at E4C, we can deliver transformative support in different formats, and we have different three different streams. We do impact research, which is basically tailor any specialized research for, for a particular objective. We do design for good, which is design work at every level. And then we do some advancing workflows, with, which is looking to optimize and innovate in their pro in organizations' processes. Just as a quick overall example, when I was a fellow, I work at the design for good aspect of our fellowship. And I work designing a high efficiency solar fridge for a Californian startup that was going to be marketed in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's the level of connections that Engineering for Change can do for you. And that's why I am the most excited to be working in Engineering for Change. So imagine myself an Ecuadorian working with a Californian startup for a project and product in Africa. That was a fantastic opportunity that I was able to have uh, because of the E4C fellowship. So about the E4C fellows, uh, and I believe, and we believe that E4C fellows are part of our secret sauce at E4C. And what we do is we source talented young early career professionals through our fellowship program, and we pair them with an impact project that will use their skills and experience and boost it. So at the same time, we also lean on the insights and strategic guidance of our global network and of multidisciplinary experts and our community of rising engineers, scientists, and architects globally to support the fellows during their stay at E4C. So we focus on building capacity while doing projects that matter. Our program is virtual, is virtual since day one, and our fellows do receive an stipend during their work with Engineering for Change. About, about our fellowship cohort of last year, so since 2014, we awarded more than 200 fellowship to young professionals representing over 40 nationalities, with a strong focus on diversity and equity and inclusion, with about 50% of women participating since 2014. Uh, last year, we hosted 40% female uh, uh, fellows uh, for a total of 57 fellows of 24 nationalities. As you can see, the bro broader aspect of engineering for change, we are worldwide, ranging from the United States to Singapore. And finally, before I hand it over to Leah to kick us off with the um, panel and introduction. And I'm happy to announce that the A4C fellowship for this year, the call for applications are now open. Um, and we have this year more than 20 projects uh, worldwide at the intersection of engineering and sustainable development. So yeah, we're looking forward to receive your applications and have you as fellows. Um, Leah, back to you. Thank you for that, Francisco. Um, we really wanted to give a, a bit of an overview of our fellowship because it's open. And that was one of the motivations for this panel is to really give different perspectives, not only of the fellowship, but also of what are the pathways that come after it. So if you're considering a career in engineering for sustainable development, not in, for sustainable development, we want you to kind of have a, a feel for not only where you can start, but also where you can go with, within this career. Um, so as we get into our panel discussion, um, one quick announcement. Unfortunately, one of our panelists, uh, Wambu Inyabero, had a personal emergency and won't be able to join us. Um, so obviously we wish her the best um, in her situation and hopefully it'll come to a, a speedy resolution. Um, to provide a bit of the perspective that she would share as an innovator, um, not necessarily the same, but uh, I will be wearing two hats today. Um, so one as a moderator, um, and then another one um, sharing a little bit from my experience um, working with startups. Um, so <laughs> with that vein, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself uh, as a panelist. So next slide, uh, Francisco. Um, so first, my name is Leah Putman. I am a senior program specialist with Engineering for Change. However, as a panelist, I will be wearing my, my former hat which was as technical director of a social enterprise, uh, Sustainable Health Enterprises, or SHE for short, which operated in Rwanda. Um, I was part of that from 2017 until 2019, right up until uh, the, just before the pandemic. Um, and so what we did at SHE was to make sanitary napkins using locally available materials. So in that case, it was um, banana fibers. Um, and so among my responsibilities was everything from product and process development and uh, 
really coordinating our massive um, goals for scale up of, of achieving 10x capacity um, in my time there, as well as looking at what are the ways that we can do this to be um, financially stable. Um, I'll, a bit of a spoiler um, that didn't end up working out, so we weren't able to, to reach the scale that we needed to. So I'll provide a little bit of that perspective of what it was like to work in a startup and also kind of what happens when, when the startup doesn't end up being successful and continuing on. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to our other panelists, um, starting with Shannon, a former fellow. Shannon. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shannon. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I have a very diverse educational background. I have a bachelor in biomedical and mechanical engineering, but then I decided to specialize in manufacturing engineering. And I just love inventions and academia in general, so I'll always be studying something. Uh, I also know that my passion lies in humanitarian projects, so I was able to really express this passion through being an E4C fellow just last year, and it was definitely one of my highlights of my engineering career. I would still say I'm in the early stage, so or early career stage, as I'm definitely still figuring out which specific industry I would like to settle in, um, but currently I work in a uh, work industry as chief engineer at a metal factory. Uh, but coincidentally, I will be uh, starting a new career next week in the academia environment at U of T, uh, where I'll be helping engineers bring their sustainable solutions into the real world. Well, that's fantastic. Congratulations on, on your new work. And we definitely look forward to hearing your perspectives um, from metal manufacturing and how you're making these, these transitions. Um, so next up, we'll pass it on to our final panelist, Eva Chang. Eva. Thanks, Leah. And congratulations, Shannon. Excited to hear about your new role and also to hear that you love academia because I must say I also do, uh, as you can see from what I'm working on at the moment. So I'm currently leading an academic school in our Faculty of Engineering and IT at the University of Technology in Sydney. And previous to this role, I've been leading a gender equity program uh, looking at gender inclusion in engineering and IT. And that's definitely a very passionate space of mine. So most recently, my connection to Engineering for Change has been through participating as a 20, 2022 uh, of Change Years and E4C Innovation Steering Committee member. And my training in the engineering background has been in telecommunications. And where I am now is in teaching. I, I found that my happy place is in education. So where I'm contributing to Engineering for Sustainable Development is in university education, bringing opportunities and experiences to students, which is exciting because we're bringing the world to the classroom and then classroom into the world. And in the Australian context, Text, that means I collaborate a lot with engineers of that borders Australia and in my own volunteering work with a women in engineering group in Timor Leste. So very happy to be with you all on the call today and I hope we have a good discussion. Thank you, Eva. We definitely appreciate your perspectives as uh, with your background in, in gender equity um, and all the work and voluntary work you're doing in the sector. Um, so as we jump into the panel discussion, I want to just give a, a little bit of quick background. Um, what does engineering for sustainable development mean? So we discuss this with our panelists to make sure we're on the same page. And we also wanted to get you there. Um, so when we're, we're discussing it here today, um, what we mean by uh, engineering for sustainable development, we mean applying engineering and technical expertise to improve the quality of life for people in the planet. So that's probably the simplest definition that we can give. Um, and this includes working towards uh, SDGs or in maybe sub disciplines and sectors of engineering that you may have heard of like humanitarian engineering or, or global engineering. Um, what we really think of when we're saying engineering for sustainable development, it's really bringing all of these things together as opposed to trying to understand what are the specific differences between them. Um, so we just want you to kind of keep that in mind um, as we get started uh, with our panel discussion. Um, and so to start us off, we will first be talking a little bit about getting started in an early career. And, and for these questions, um, Francisco will be moderating. So Francisco, take it away. 
All right, thanks, Leah. And as Leah just mentioned, I, I, the first part of this uh, panel will be talking about early career. I'm asking these questions, but I'm because I'm early career myself, so I, I can empathize a little bit on uh, what is going to be asked. So um, for all of the panelists, we can probably kick it off with uh, Shannon and then with Eva. So all of you have careers or interests, interests in sustainability and or sustainable development. What was your entry point to this type of work? Yeah, so I can start us off here. Um, I actually didn't even know what sustainable development meant until after I joined E4C. And the term sustainable development was something that I never really thought to try to define myself. So the opportunity at E4C stood out to me because of the real world impact that I myself could put into action. And I found out that while pursuing my degree in university, I somewhat hid behind books with the long-term objective to obtain my degree. But engineering has such a powerful potential, like potential to give someone a better life or positively impact a community um, or a, even a city. It boils down to be able to put that knowledge into practice and E4C definitely gave me that real world opportunity. So being a fellow um, last year has taught me that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, uh, you can make a positive difference on a community, literally across the globe, and making this impact that matters, seeing our engineering practices make an actual difference was my passion. So through E4C, I learned that my passion is actually entirely directly linked to the term sustainable development. It means applying our engineering and technical expertise just to improve the quality of life for people um, all over the globe. And it encompasses United Nations SDGs, humanitarian engineering, global engineering, et cetera. So although I'm still navigating career paths, I know that tackling sustainable development uh, through my unique engineering skill set is what I want to do. And so if there is someone in the audience who can relate to this, I would definitely encourage to ask yourself, how can you leverage your current academic training to improve global issues present in our society today? So that would be your entry work into uh, or entry point into this kind of work. Yeah, no, that, thanks for that, for sharing that, Shana. I love what you said about sustainable development getting everywhere, like, and it's important everywhere and just how we can start finding some pathways uh, probably in every industry and as we keep growing and this becomes even more important with SDGs and, and um, you know, current trends. Uh, with that, I'll open to, to Eva. Uh, Eva, please share us with you your perspective. Thanks, Francisco. And I must say, I, sh I share a little bit of passion for engineering with Shannon in terms of the impact that we can have. You know, engineers design things generally to improve people's lives. So that's how I first uh, got into engineering is through my degree. And I must admit, I, I did love research. So I started a PhD uh, and I was procrastinating a lot. And when I was procrastinating, I actually discovered my passion for social justice uh, through volunteering because there's a lot of social justice activities at the university and yes I, I didn't spend a lot of time doing research in those years but I actually found what I really wanted to do so I did a lot of volunteering with nonprofits, uh, including Oxfam we started an organization on campus but there was always something that wasn't quite enough uh, I really love engineering I love my technical capabilities and skills and design and I couldn't quite see how that fitted into the work of uh, other NGOs at the time and that's when I discovered engineers without borders and all the dots connected uh, in my procrastination world so that's kind of where I've started and continued, and that's also where I teach today. Uh, and I'll also share that at the time, I'm going to show my age a little bit, uh, with a telecommunications engineering background, I didn't always see how I fit in to the humanitarian engineering or sustainable development uh, sector at the stage because there was a lot of work in water and sanitation and infrastructure. I know nothing about civil, mechanical, and electrical engineering, but I think 
the world has changed. Uh, I see a lot of work for ICT uh, engineers and IT professionals as well. And most pro projects I've seen in, in the last six months have been around data management. So I very much feel at home now and I'm glad I've got kind of persisted and just kept with my curiosity to meet with new people and just get involved in stuff. Thanks, Eva. Such an interesting journey. And yeah, I agree. Like even with this DG, is it DG9, which is uh, infrastructure, it kind of connects a lot of that work. So exciting. And also want to remark what you mentioned about procrastination. And this might be controversial, but I do believe there is a benefit of, you know, procrastinating, just creating that room for serendipity to happen. So happy that you share that. Moving uh, to our next question, and I'll, I guess we can go in the same order. So and it's for both panelists. How did you navigate uncertainty at early stages in your career to determine that you wanted to continue with the, within the space? We know that this is a challenging environment. Sometimes it's not really clear. So how did you navigate that particular challenges? Um, Shannon? I am definitely the one to answer any question regarding uncertainty. <laughs> Commitment in the career space has always been something that scared me. And a common response I got from someone who viewed my CV or resume was, what a mess. It's all over the place. Um, are you a biomedical engineer or are you a mechanical engineer? Because it says both on your resume. Um, so I often question what I want to do, whether this is the right path, et cetera. Um, this may sound cliche, but do what makes you happy. Um, do work that doesn't feel like work. And I knew I loved tackling sustainable development. Um, that was a desire. So pursuing E4C made it a career for me. And if it's not working, I would be self-reflective and ask yourself, why do you feel uncertain in this job or path? Remind yourself of what makes you get up in the morning. So for me personally, I don't really navigate uncertainty in my career because navigating implies that you're aiming for a destination. Um, I don't have a destination. The journey is just as important as the path um, or, or as the result, sorry. So focus on the journey right in front of you. Be happy. Take it day by day and um, if you need to and just keep options open. Build your network and do what you love. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that, Sean. I'm 100% uh, relatable with that CV all over the place. Uh, I am a mechanical engineer doing marketing, so I I kind of like relate to that. Eva, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think taking an interest in what you do is just super important. You know, life's too short to be doing things for other people's reasons. Uh, so how I kind of dealt with the uncertainty of my technical skills, how I could connect out to my interest and passion in social justice was just curiosity. When things were would come up that were of interest and I was just wanting to find out what I could do, how I could contribute. I put my hand up for things. Uh, so volunteering for things, getting onto committees, uh, going on to trips, projects. You just never know what ha happened if you just volunteer yourself to, to contribute. And that's where I met uh, a lot of people who are in this space because uh, we're not necessarily always visible about the work that we're doing because we're very busy doing the work. Uh, so I would just say, please do not be shy. Um, I've never heard someone say, no, please don't come and give some time and resources to us. Uh, in terms of the kind of where I sit now with sustainable engineering, I, I will also share that I was never sure whether I wanted to do field work or whether I wanted to stay in academia because engineering is very practical. So I went and applied for a placement overseas uh, just about a year and a half ago, and I loved it, but I, I realized I love education more, but I wouldn't have figured that out if I hadn't done it. So I think 100% get curious, get out there. It, nothing's going to go wrong. You're just going to have a great journey and learn a lot and meet some fabulous people. Thanks for, for sharing that, Eva. I totally kind of like, I love what you said about volunteering. I just kind of like get the work and just kind of like the experience before deciding. I think it's fantastic. And volunteering seems to be a great way to uh, get your feet in, in the door. Um, I also would like to ask this question to, to Leah. Leah, what do you think about this? 
Yeah, so I really agree with what Shannon and, and Ava said about really being curious. Um, so I think early on in my career, I first worked with an engineering society, a biomedical engineering society doing meeting planning. So I think one thing that I would say is if you don't see your ideal job, look for something or, or an opportunity that has some aspect that interests you. So with that one, it was simply the fact that I had the opportunity, if I did a good job, to be able to go to this research meeting and talk with a bunch of people in the field, which ended up being really um, beneficial and helpful for building my network. I can say I probably had the biggest biomedical engineering network of any of my sophomore peers um, because I had gone to this conference and, and had worked in it. Um, so, so I think really navigating uncertainty came down to, again, that, that curiosity and just trying things. It's like, okay, I'm not sure about 60% of this, but 40% sounds good. And since I'm not exactly sure where I want to go, let's, let's find out about that 40%. Uh, thanks, Leah, for sharing. I, I love what you said about just uh, focusing on what would you want to learn from that particular experience. Um, moving to our next uh, question uh, again for all our panelists. So um, we're talking about early careers and how important are those early development opportunities, you know, like D4C fellowship or orders in launching your career? How relevant do you see uh, this type of opportunities? Maybe we can go Eva and then Shannon. I think these early opportunities are really important and it's a great opportunity, but it's not essential. You know, I would say I discovered this area quite late. It was in my postgraduate studies, so I'd already done a good five years at university. So it, it's never too late. Um, but again, on the curiosity thing, uh, get, get curious as soon as you're comfortable too, because then you have time on your hands to, to discover what your journey could be. Uh, and it's always okay to not exactly know where you're going. I think Shannon alluded to this before. Uh, if anyone had asked me five, ten years ago, would I be working in this space as an academic in sustainable engineering development or leading a gender equity program? I'd be like, no, who's going to pay me to do that? But, you know, as you develop your skills and your network, people will see the value and appreciate the value. And if the opportunity doesn't yet exist, you can co-create it with people. So I think the earlier you get involved, uh, the more time you have to find out where you want to be. Thanks for sharing that, Eva. I, I love what you, you mentioned uh, right there. Um, Shannon, what's, what's your take? Yeah, so these early development opportunities will tremendously shape you into who you will be personally, but professionally as well. Um, if you have the slightest bit of interest in pursuing an opportunity, I would trust that gut feeling and go for it. Early opportunities will never be a waste. Um, it is an opportunity for growth and can help define your interests and passions for the future. So, for example, I had no idea that my underlying passion was directly cor correlated with uh, sustainable development. Um, the one piece of advice I would give, though, is I would encourage anyone to at least apply if there is the slightest bit of interest. And I say this because the E4C cohort um, can be considered prestigious and it is a network of people, some of the brightest individuals around the world who are exceptional in their own field. And I thought I wouldn't be a competitive applicant at all, uh, but you must try. The first step is applying and show your passion if it's there. Um, I've wanted to uh, badly be a part of this group where everyone shares the same interests and strong passion uh, for collectively making groundbreaking solutions for sustainable development. So personally, I would rather try and receive, um, say, a rejection letter than to not have tried at all. Thanks so much, Sharon. We appreciate it. Uh, your your feedback and opinion around the fellowship. Uh, just to emphasize that we do value a lot of passion in the field as we also provide the training. So you're not familiar with this sustainable space. Please do not think that you need to have it for to apply. Like if you're interested and passionate about it, we'll take that as a yes. So uh, yeah, 100% with you, Shannon. So I'm gonna uh, transition and um back to Leah to moderate the second part of the panel, but just as a conclusion, like 
we're talking about early career and I think the topic is being just curiosity, be curious and dare to explore. I think that's what we are kind of like coming back in this type of early career advice. Um, Liam, um, back to you. Yeah, so I, I definitely agree. Curiosity was definitely a theme there. Um, being comfortable, being uncertain was also something that came up. And I think another one, which will be important as we move on and talk about career growth um, and challenges was a little bit came up about, about networking. Um, so those, I imagine those themes will come up again later. Um, but as we do talk about career growth and applying for these early career uh, positions and positions throughout, um, everything, every job description talks about skills. What are the skills that you need? What's the skill set that they're looking for? And, and how are you going to use those skills to do a good job? Um, and of course, the fellowship is, is one example, but this is honestly everywhere. Um, so maybe we can start off with you, Shannon, with this question. Um, from your experience, what are the skills that someone might need to be successful working in sustainable development? Yeah, so the United Nations has developed 17 goals that the planet needs for peace and prosperity. And they are known as sustainable development goals, the SDGs. And these goals are some of the world's most difficult challenges to solve. Um, they can include poverty or the scarcity of water um, to climate inaction and so forth. So because of the scale of these goals um, and the geographical regions that they span to, I personally find that working well in teams that are uh, multicultural, diverse, working remotely is so incredibly important. Um, learning how to best interact with other engineers um, who live in a different time zone um, or who has access to different engineering softwares, who operate with different engineering standards, but collectively coming up with a solution is extremely critical. And E4C highlighted this skill set for me, um, remote teamwork and international communication. Yes, I think especially as we become more connected and certainly post um, COVID that remote work and, and collaboration will continue to be incre increasingly important um, in the field. Um, as a bit of a follow up um, and then turning this to, to you, Eva, um, were there any skills or perhaps a mindset that you felt were more critical to develop um, to help you better navigate your work and your pro career progression and, and maybe even more as a woman. <laughs> um, so if you can share your perspective. Yeah, I, I might just quickly respond to the the skills. I think I, I love the, the, the skills that Shannon, that Shannon uh, shared, but environments change and we change and system change. So we're never always going to have all the skills that we think we need or that are listed. So I think what's important is this mindset of wanting to give back to sustainable development and being willing to learn new things to adapt and to work with different people because you will learn what you need in the context in which you need it. Uh, so you don't need to have all of the skills that are on job applications or any other applications that you might be thinking of. If you're interested in it, I 150% back Shannon's point about just apply because what's going to go wrong, right? You might get rejected and then ask for feedback. You know, once I applied for a scholarship and I think I applied three times because I just really wanted it uh, and they gave me feedback every time and I was just going to persist until they gave it to me and they did. Um, I'll also like to share the linking back to the previous point about early opportunities. Um, the fellowship was very exciting to me when I first learned about it in 2018 because I could see it was something missing in the education sector to introduce sustainable engineering development to students. And I also knew that they didn't have the skills uh, that were listed on there, but I knew that they could get there because of where they wanted to go and the mindsets and the experiences that they wanted to jump into. So that for me was a enough to put them forward. Thank you for that. Yes, and, and I think it's um, great to share and, and great to hear that you don't need to have all the skills, um, that really just being willing to, to learn and grow and having that mindset about learning is helpful um, and maybe something to keep in mind as everyone here is looking for that next opportunity, whether it's the, the fellowship or a job or a scholarship or, or maybe even applying to, to university. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, 
Um, anytime we interact with people and their, their relationships, Shannon, you talked about remote collaboration. So there's, and working with, with people around the world, there are different dynamics, there are different cultures, um, different power dynamics that we need to kind of sense um, and to navigate. And so often in a work environment, this could be like work or office politics, um, but sometimes that might be taking it down too small. So we'll start off with you, Ava. How have you dealt with uh, some of these power dynamics uh, or relationship um, is issues in your work? And this can be whether it's being novice versus experienced, uh, gender, um, or socioeconomic, any of these things? Yeah, great question. And I wish someone had asked me 10 years ago because I would have had a very different answer. I used to hide from politics. I just wanted to get on with what I wanted to do, the impact that I wanted to make, and I would just avoid uh, workplace politics. But I'm a bit older now. I'm aware of it. Uh, I don't always necessarily accept it uh, because of my, I guess, mindset towards social justice. Why do power dynamics exist? Uh, we don't have to just experience them and deal with it as it is. We do have opportunity to change here. So awareness. Uh, I no longer hide. I spend a lot of time observing. So what is happening in the space in which I'm trying to do my work and trying to make an impact? Who is there? Who is not there? Who are making the decisions? Who are influencing? those who are making the decisions the people who are speaking may not always be the influencers but also be mindful on who's not included who's not there and understanding where why that might be uh, so I spend a lot of time observing and also speaking to people to make sure that I understand the context. I do struggle a lot with power dynamics and uh, politics in, in the workplace because I always think, you know, if we work collaboratively together towards a common purpose, then does this necessarily need to exist? But humans are humans, uh, so it is what it is. I think to watch change because especially in a university which is very hierarchical you know we're built on hierarchy I work in an engineering faculty where there is gender imbalance I'm very mindful on what is my realm of concern and what is my realm of control uh, where I can uh, contribute to narrowing the power distances than I do from the classroom to the teams that I work in to be very mindful of not introducing more power dynamics so yeah it's a tricky question And you answered it very beautifully. I think it's it's really good to focus in on what what we can control and how we can contribute positively and and not uh, add to these things that can often um, detract from our from our goal and our primary mission. Um, because yes, these do exist, but as you said, we're all humans. But that's not why we all studied engineering. That's that's not why we want to work in this space. Um, so shifting to you, Shannon, maybe going a little bit beyond power dy dynamics. Um, but if you want to, to answer on that, that's fine. Um, can you share about a challenge that you faced in your career um, and maybe how you overcame it, or if it's something going on now, kind of what you're doing to tackle? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in general, I would say commitment. Um, I am at a fork between choosing the work industry and academia. Um, I never know whether the path I'm currently on is right. And this is something I am tackling every single day. But I have went through a tremendous amount of self-reflection. And going back to what I previously mentioned, it ultimately boils down to um, what you love to do. And what is currently helping me um, is reaching out to people, talking to people, talking to people who have different um, experiences uh, than you. And so I've I'm very grateful to have um, a lot of mentors, uh, people in my inner circle, even just talking to family, um, just putting yourself out there, expanding your network, um, just learning, learning through people. Um, it's something I am uh, tackling every single day. But yeah, I would say just gathering self-confidence, self-esteem, and commitment to uh, commit to a single path. Thanks for that. Um, I, I hope and think that as continue to gather information and experiences that you'll find the path that um, is worth committing to um, based on your, your goals and kind of your, uh, your own passions. 
Um, I think for me in this space, one challenge that that I faced um, when I was working, whether it was with a startup or in sort of an established company was kind of what you face when you're working in, in developing new products and, and new technology. And that's kind of what happens when it doesn't work out. Um, so whether it was in a, in a space where I was in a larger company, you know, I had coworkers who they were working on a project and it didn't end up launching. So now you have a bunch of development engineers and they need to find new jobs, whether it's internal or externally. Um, and it, it actually looked uh, much the same as kind of the experience that I went through when I was working with, with She with Sustainable Health Enterprises. Um, and I really think the, the main way to kind of overcome this is really to chart your own career path. Um, and I say that as in, you can kind of get comfortable. Um, you get in a place and you're like, oh, this is nice. And, and you become a little bit passive in your own career as opposed to thinking, oh, what could be cool to do next? Um, what's the next thing that I want to learn? What's sort of the next place that might be interesting to kind of move into? Um, because when you think about those things, then you're set up for sort of the what ifs even before you know it. So um, when I was working with she, I happened to start looking into some courses uh, specifically around understanding what I was doing, which was converting agricultural waste. And that led me somehow into a, a specific design school. And when we found out that, hey, we were running out of funding and doesn't look like we'll be able to renew, I was able to then uh, apply fully for that program that I was exposed to just during my, my online coursework. So I think, yeah, for me, I, I can say that um, taking that time to think about, hey, what's what's interesting me? What's interesting to me now in my my career um, can be really helpful in terms of going forward. And I think that's actually quite similar to to what you were saying, Shannon, about just gathering information and about you know staying curious and 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 really not being complacent. Um, and this can be really relevant within engineering for sustainable development, where often um, you have shorter term um, jobs where. You know, with de development organizations, it's a six month or a year or, or two year uh, kind of position uh, where you really need to kind of think of, oh, I'm learning this cool stuff and, and this is where I want to go. Um, so thank you both. Um, and actually, Shannon, you mentioned talking to your mentors and allies. So we'll get into that uh, a little bit more here in the next section, uh, which uh, Francisco will be talking about just that, um, mentors, how to find them, and also a little bit about sponsorship and allyship. Uh, Francisco? And uh, thanks, Leah. And this is a topic that excites me quite a lot, uh, given that I'm also uh, traveling to, you know, finding the right mentor. And that's some, it's a topic that I found particularly interesting. And um, also just to shout out what you were mentioning about continuous development opportunities to just keep growing as you're working. I think that's fantastic. And, and just want to shout out that particular uh, topic that you guys covered. So Shannon, um, as Leah mentioned, you talked about uh, referring to your mentors. So we all have people who help us to get where we are, you know, mentor, coaches, sponsors, teachers, maybe a book, <laughs> all fit into this category. So think one of such person, feel free to shout him out and, and tell us how would they help you to get into your current position? Yeah, so I am someone who is very vocal, especially with any difficulties that arise in my daily life. I wouldn't say that there is just one person who has helped me get where I am today um, or who I am today. So it's so important to me to have this inner circle of people who I trust that can that I can turn to. And each person has their own strengths. So depending on what kind of support I need, it may be better to turn to one person over the other um, simply because they have lived through the experience before and they can offer better advice. Or perhaps the other person just simply listens better. Um, so collectively, I feel that this inner circle um, comprised of maybe six, seven people has been extremely valuable mentors in my life. They consist of friends, professors, family. They can be anyone uh, who would help you reach your goals in a heartbeat and who wouldn't judge you for anything. Thanks for, for sharing that, Shannon. And kind of like moving to our next question, I just want to provide a bit of context. And so when we are um, 
as early careers, I do believe we are really vulnerable also to bad advice. So we are also really, really, really receptive to good advice. Uh, but it's hard to tell when advice is, you know, bad advice or you're reaching out to the wrong person. And that's something I personally experienced myself uh, when deciding my career pathway, that someone just gave me bad advice and I realized it was bad advice like five years in the future. <laughs> so kind of like on that context, uh, how did you find your helper or mentor? Can you give advice, any advice on how someone can seek out to such a person and initiate this type of relationships? So during the E4C fellowship, um, I had a mentor. I was extremely ambitious to deliver the best that I can give. And I would be easily upset with myself if I fell short from what I expected the result to be, or if I didn't deliver my best. Um, so during the E4C, every fellow was assigned to an expert fellow. And this fellow is truly an expert. They have been in your shoes before. They are there to guide you, support you, talk to you, everything. As completing the E4C fellowship was one of my greatest endeavors, um, I need to express my greatest gratitude to my expert fellow. Uh, her name is Kyla Strickler. And the opportunity to be mentored by expert fellows like Kyla is one of E4C's greatest incentives because these fellows are so accomplished and unique and uh, they inspire me to adopt their leadership and follow their footsteps to achieve even greater things in sustainable development. Thanks for sharing that, Shannon. I love that you shout out, shout out Kyla. Like I personally love Kyla. I think she's, she's fantastic. And what is interesting, I just want to like do a quick overview, like Kyla was a fellow as you were, uh, she was a fellow in, in my cohort, we were in the same small group, so we interacted quite a lot. And we actually bonded so well that we did a quick road trip together through Ecuador with Kyla and we kind of like, and it was fun because it was an engineering trip, plus, I mean, because we were speaking basically 100% of the time engineering work and our fellowship work, but also it was kind of like just a nice and networking opportunity with kind of like, like my peers while road tripping. So that's all, um, some of the stuff that tends to happen in the engineering for change fellowship. And it's excited to know uh, that Kyla has grown so much since I interacted with her in 2021. Yeah. Uh, so Eva, shifting to you, um, uh, shifting from a general mentorship to allies, how have people around you helped to advocate for you and sponsor you? How important it is to be an advocate or sponsor? Yeah, super important because there are different roles that people can play around you. So mentors and coaches are kind of more well known for given guidance and advice for the specific things you want to achieve. Sponsorship, I just want to chat a little bit about because it's something I hadn't learned about until the last few years and it's very different to mentoring. And I think there's been a lot of sponsors in my career, in my life so far, but I actually didn't know they were my sponsors because what they're doing is they're advocating for me, my work and my purposes when I'm not in the room. They may be supporting me, creating opportunities and just doing background work and setting up pathways. So I think that's something to be mindful of is it's not just looking for mentors and coaches, but also who can support you when you're not there, especially if we're not yet in the decision making making and leadership circles where some of those conversations are happening because we're still grappling with the power dynamics. Uh, so yeah, don't be shy to ask for sponsors as well. Something someone sent to me a little while ago, and I love this concept, is just to consider who your board of directors might be for your life or your career, what that might be um, for that diverse guidance. And I do mean diverse because Mentors, coaches, sponsors could be people who are very different to you. I learn from our students all the time. I, I consider them as my mentors, especially in understanding what the concerns and the aspirations are of young people, uh, but also different backgrounds. Um, I think Shannon mentioned this as well, of her mentor being from uh, a very different background to her. Different backgrounds mean different experiences and different trainings. So some of my friends have become my mentors because they are in creative professions and they approach problem solving very differently. So don't be shy to ask anybody to be involved uh, in your career pathways, conversations, even if they're not engineers. And if they're not engineers, it's actually probably a good thing. 
I love what you said about it not being engineers. Uh, you know, like I, we do at Engineering for Change, we also believe that it's, it's, it's important to have that diverse perspective and just kind of like listen and learn from all different industries and backgrounds just to kind of like uh, understand how to collaborate better even. So I, uh, I love what you said about pairing up with non-engineers and just open that uh, mentality. So moving to our next question, and actually this is my favorite question in the panel. I'm super excited to ask this. Uh, so, and this is something I struggle my, myself as a man. So uh, what is one thing we can do regardless of gender to be a good ally for women? I'll uh, ask it to you, Eva, and then uh, to Shannon. I love this question. Uh, I'm going to be very mindful not to speak for hours and hours about this question. Um, I might just start with what we just mentioned around sponsorship and advocacy because gender inclusion and equality and equity is not a women's problem. It's actually for everybody and everybody has a role to play and can contribute and make a difference. So, you know, do advocate for gender inclusion and equality wherever you are, regardless of who's in the room. Uh, and that means speaking up for people, speaking out for people, but also recognizing opportunities. So in reflection, I'm really grateful to those who tap me on the shoulder for opportunities because I would often look at things and go, yeah, that's not for me. I, I don't have half these skills. I don't have 50 research papers. That I can't do that. But people would go, actually, have you thought about presenting yourself this way or just forget about that. Just put your CV in. You just never know what might happen. Uh, so tapping that person on the shoulder would be possibly a very big move for them. Sharing your networks would be another one. We do know that um, networks do depend on your access to social equity, and that is not equitably accessed for everybody. So bring someone with you uh, to a networking event because you are then broadening their network with yours. Um, last point, maybe two last points calling in and out in non-inclusive behaviors, uh, because if we don't speak out uh, with any kind of microaggressions, then it kind of propagates some of the behaviors that really need to change. And culture change takes small changes to make big changes. So if we don't start small, we will never get to the big. Um, and the whole getting it right and wrong, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to use uh, language that we didn't know wasn't okay. Someone will tell you, we learn, we don't do it again. It's okay. Thanks for sharing uh, those four points. I thought those were on, on point. And I love the particular one and just kind of like acknowledging that you might be wrong and how you kind of like you're completely inclusive and even in your language, that's something I struggle myself with. I, uh, so. Uh, yeah, just acknowledging that you can always keep going, I think it's fantastic. Um, um, Shannon, what are your thoughts? I would definitely agree with um, a lot of points that Ava brought up. Um, I agree with the networking, be open to meet new people, but also reach out to, to those you haven't connected with in a while. Um, Ava also mentioned making mistakes, like we're all human. I. I make mistakes daily, um, so I am very grateful for uh, the people in my life who um, are able to listen and provide support and advice. So um, I would like to give back to my network um, and listen. Time is something that I can always try to give to anyone and everyone. And speaking of that, if there's anyone in the webinar who would like to reach out to me, please feel free to connect with me, um, maybe through LinkedIn, or I'd be more than happy to chat uh, further. But uh, yeah, definitely um, just having that uh, inner circle, able to listen, um, but also providing that as a two-way street as well. Uh, thanks for sharing, Sharon. I love what you said about listening. I think that's something uh, crucial. And that's, I mean, just coming from a design engineering perspective, like human-centered design, it's all about listening and understanding uh, what are the needs. So I love what you said about how you can be a good advocate for women just by listening and making sure you're understanding what are the needs and the pain points and how can you address uh, from a listening perspective. So yeah, thanks for sharing uh, that, uh, Shannon. 
uh, with that, I'll close this part of mentorships and allyships, and I'll transition it back to Leah to kick us off with the final part of the panel. Thank you for that. And to anyone who's asking questions in the Q&A, we will get to that in just a moment. Um, first, uh, we want to just finish off with a little bit of talk about, about leadership. And so certainly being a good ally and, and a lot of the things about growing, reaching out to people, sharing your networks are, are definitely ways to um, perhaps extend followership, which can, can be helpful in this way, even without needing to do it, it it'll end up happening. Um, but maybe to close us out, Eva, what are some skills or maybe activities that you're currently um, being very intentional about um, or, or developing, um, which are allowing you to be uh, most effective as a leader? I have a very long list. I love learning. Not to say that, you know, I'm not good enough, but I just love learning. Uh, so I'll keep it succinct and short. But lis listening, uh, what Francisco just said, being a really purposeful and respectful listener, because as a leader, it's not about you. It, it's about supporting the people you're working with, understanding them and helping them to get to where we all need to be together. So that's, that's something I'm definitely always working on. And to that point, languages, it makes a difference to learn a little bit of the languages of those who you are working with, or you would like to work with, because it shows that you care, it shows that you are making a genuine effort to join their space and uh, you respect the cultures that, that they're living in. And also want to mention that language is a very key part of culture and identity so it's it's a bit of a just showing that I, I want to be involved uh, so I'm currently learning one language and it's very difficult but yeah I'm getting there um something else I'm working on is I think we talked about this a little bit is how to be uncomfortable no how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable um I'm very non-confrontational I don't like having difficult conversations but as a leader I'm going to have to, I have to make difficult decisions and it's my responsibility to communicate that. So how do I do that with care, respect and empathy? And how do I support the people who are affected? So you don't just leave them, right? How do we make sure that they're okay to the next step? Um, and this is very difficult for me because I want to help everybody, uh, but that is just not possible. And I think the final thing is, um, being comfortable with failure and making mistakes to learn. Uh, for most of my life, I've been a perfectionist and uh, it's only been the last maybe five years I've let that go because perfectionism doesn't exist. Uh, it's a bar that keeps raising and it's tail chasing. So yeah, learning to love failure for learning. I think all of those are great and, and, and very uh, helpful. So um Definitely something to take away. I, I love the, the languages um, and showing that respect for different cultures. I, I definitely agree with it. I tried to, I've tried to do that when the, I've had opportunities to travel. And I think that's really very important, especially in this space, um, because it's so important to work with different cultures. We come up with better solutions. We come up um, with better approaches to things. And I think that respect for culture is, is really important. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you both. Uh, thank you all for being here um, and for just sharing with this moderated section of the panel. Um, so thank you, Zoom applause. Um, and for those who have been just talking and asking questions in the chat, we will kind of get to those now. So thank you for your patience. We, we didn't miss you. Um, so I think we'll just get started with the top of the list. Um, this is from Caroline Wita. Uh, how, would you, how would one know if you are contributing to sustainable development through your engineering work? What are the metrics? Um, so I don't know which of you would like to answer this. Eva, you're nodding, so I'm tending to say you. <laughs> uh, look, I've, um, I've thrown myself under the bus. Uh, I love the question. Um, let me think about what I want to say. Um, metrics is a good one uh, because I struggle with defining success. And I think it's important to identify the impact that you want to make because impact means different things to different people. 
So for me, it's most definitely in gender, but for somebody else, it could be environmental impact or it could be multi-factor. So it really depends. And I think we also need to recognize the impact is very difficult to measure. Unfortunately, outputs and outcomes are very different. Uh, outputs, number of projects, number of people involved doesn't necessarily mean the change has been made. So it takes time to measure sustainable impact. So it's a very unclear answer, but um, make sure you're clear on what you're looking for and be okay with not knowing exactly what the impact is, uh, especially immediately. I think I'll add to that, uh, asking this question of whoever is in leadership at, you, at your, your work um, is one good way to do it. Um, so if there's a particular aspect of sustainable development that you're interested in, say, hey, do we contribute to, you know, uh, reducing climate change or, or positively impacting the environment? Um, I think from my experience in a startup, sometimes it's easier because you're setting these metrics, especially in a social enterprise. So because we were working on um, creating sanitary products locally. One of our metrics from the beginning was number of, of days that, you know, girls were in school. Um, and that's something that we could measure and where we're, uh, where we're selling our products and, and offering them, that's something that we can look for, for a Delta in. Um, but as Ava said, it's not always that clear, but that is uh, definitely something that can be set. Um, and so I think this is a great question to put to whoever you may be working with and, and asking them those questions. And that's probably where you're going to get um, the best answer for general metrics. The SDGs, they have like the high level goals and they have targets and they have sub targets. So they actually get really quite um, specific. Um, so those can maybe provide some guidance. Just to, to add on this topic, and this is a topic that I'm particularly interested in, and so I love what Leah mentioned about the SDGs and actually trying to tailor to the indicators. So sometimes you say SDG 7, but actually like understanding what the indicator for that SDG is and which target you're talking is kind of like a nice way to kind of like ground it. But I just kind of listen an entry point to this type of kind of like uh, impact assessment. I think uh, kind of like the starting point is just building or helping or asking for your employer to kind of like provide you uh, the theory of change. What is the theory of change you're working on? So that way you can start uh, try to plan and defining some metrics around that particular theory of change you build. So if you don't have a theory of change, go build a theory of change. I think that's kind of like step one. <laughs> um, yeah, and before we go to the next question, I will say the maybe industry or corporate equivalent to a theory of change is mainly your corporate strategy um, or, or roadmap. So the terminology may be different there. Um, but shifting to our next question, how do you look for and find opportunities such as the E4C fellowship? Um, so I can start. There are opportunities on the Engineering for Change website. So to become, uh, to be, take part in this um, webinar, you became a member. Um, and so through that, we definitely share opportunities. Um, there is an opportunity section within the website. Um, and that, so that's where we post our own, like the fellowship, but there are also job opportunities there. And, and these can be in different countries. Um, thank you, Erin, for, for posting that. Um, so you can look for something in a place where you want to work or, or where you're currently located. Um, I think the other big one is definitely the networking piece. Um, I mentioned that I my first internship happened to be with the Engineering Society. I think basically every job I've had from that has been a bit of a ripple effect from that first opportunity um, that was really quite, quite random um, and just me walking in and happened to get lucky. Um, so I will, if anybody else has uh, anything else to add um, to that question, finding opportunities. Yeah, I would love to add. Um, I would say exposure. And so for me personally, how did I come across E4C? I kept myself immersed in the academic environment. Um, so first, I actually worked for years at a startup company and I decided to go back to academia to do my master's degree. And being immersed in the academic environment, I've become a sponge for knowledge, but also a sponge for opportunities. There are so many opportunities that are just thrown at students. Um, it's impossible to, it, it's, um, it's a wonderful feeling. 
to be immersed in so much opportunities. E4C is something that was advertised at my university. And I got so excited because it directly related with my interests. Um, I didn't actually know that uh, my passion was sustainable development. So E4C helped define my interests in that way. But for me personally, it's just being immersed in the academic environment. Um, that's how I've learned of so many opportunities like E4C. Thank you uh, for that. Yeah, if I can add just something uh, on exposure and because I love what Shannon said about exposure and just, just getting yourself in the radar of these people. Another nice way to do it that is a little bit kind of like actionable is find, for, find challenges. Find, you know, these kind of like design challenges, uh, um, any type of university challenge, because those are often sponsored by companies or industry. So that's kind of like a nice way for you to get in the radar of these companies. And kind of like something I've learned and kind of a bit the hard way is that you need to believe in yourself first. Uh, and kind of like challenges is a nice way for you to show what you can do uh, with your own motivation. And that's something that will get you in the radar of the right people. So that's a a nice opportunity to keep going, I guess. Um, back to you, Leah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that, that addition. I think that's helpful. Um, so the next question says, many of the entry-level opportunities within sustainable development seem to be unpaid and very low. How do I get experience and navigate these when working unpaid is not an option? Um, and it feels like only people from wealthy backgrounds can enter the profession. Uh, yes, I've seen this and, and I understand, and that is true for quite a few of them. Um, one that I can say based on my background, I actually worked maybe not so much in what would be clearly defined as sustainable development. I did work in the medical professional, so arguably still working toward the good health and well-being, um, but for more of a mainstream and large company. So if those opportunities are available to you, there's still a way for you to, to learn and to gain skills and, and to get that first step of experience um, in a way that meets you where you are and meets your, your economic needs, which is important. And you know your financial and, and mental and, and personal sustainability is step one for you to be able to contribute to sustainable development within the world. Um, so if that's an option, you can try that. There are some opportunities and these are also tend to be the more competitive ones where if it is um, unpaid, um, they may it may be a, a, a kind of position where they, they cover it. So one of my experiences was with Engineering World Health. Um, and so that is now available where you can be, uh, where you can, excuse me, apply for a scholarship. And so if you're interested in biomedical engineering and electronics, they can support you to maybe travel somewhere um, and get experience working. And so it's not paid, but they also cover your expenses. Um, so it's got a, kind of a net zero, um, which may not be ideal, um, but it's certainly better than having to go into your pocket when you don't have that ability um, or that, that opening. Um, there are a few of those around. It's gonna take, again, um, just kind of looking for, for what's out there on the internet. Again, you can check the Engineering for Change website, um, but those those opportunities exist. I don't know if anyone else knows of things like that. Yeah, happy to add some thoughts to this as well, because I do understand where the question's coming from, is perhaps it's, we don't always get to where we want to be immediately. So what's the next good fit. Is there a, an organization or an industry where it's not necessarily indirectly sustainable development engineering, but they're not being unsustainable. And in that way, you are perhaps looking after your economic needs, as Leah mentioned, but also building up the skills and contributing in a different way to uh, sustainable engineering. And then you can make the next step. So it's maybe a little bit of planning to how to get to where you want to be. Thank you for that. And yeah, it, planning and kind of taking the non-conventional route is definitely a, a thing to do when, when you have to move around. Um, uh, so the next question says, you've discussed networking and the importance of expanding your network. Do you have any advice around how to get started networking? Um, networking virtually or internationally when there aren't many opportunities locally and I can't afford to travel? 
So another very relevant question. Um, I will pause and see if someone else wants to answer first, because I can also add. Happy to just maybe unpack what we mean by networking, because for me, networking is making connections. And it doesn't mean I have to go into a room either virtually or in person with 50 other people. Uh, what matters is genuine connection and the genuine is really important. So it could be having a look for who is doing the work you would like to be doing or in the sector and just shooting them a message could be a LinkedIn message um I, I'm not very social media so help help me out but yeah emailing them or whatever it might be that for me already is networking um so I recently um have been looking into how we might collaborate with international gender equity organizations so I've just been randomly emailing different organizations to see who's ready for a conversation and to me that is networking because it's a bit of a branch hey I'm interested in doing this or I have a passion in this area would you like to chat about whatever it might be? Um, and, and I'll add, um, so not a personal experience, but with that of, uh, of my husband. So uh, for him, a lot of networking, because he was also in a very small town um, and works in, in engineering and a lot of manufacturing and welding. So a lot of his networking came from just uh, really having more of an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so being willing to just say, hey, um, does anybody need uh, something done? So can you share it and kind of let the people around you know what your skills are? Because they may have a need that you may not be aware of. Um, and as those people start to know, they may be able to share um, what those skills are. And then word of mouth starts to create opportunities. And you can um, maybe find out about more of them that way. Um, the other way to do it is to seek out maybe people um, who can travel. And so if you're living living in a place I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, where, where I live in, in Rwanda for years, it was smaller. So if you reach out to people who do tend to move in and out, so these are often the people who have shops and who uh, have larger shops. And, and so they're, they're bringing things back and forth. Um, they might, they're going to know where things are as they're moving around and as they're, they're bringing in their goods for, for their store. So reaching out to people who may know about places and opportunities in places that you can't go to. Um, and, and really just getting to know them. I think that the genuine connection that Ava mentioned is really important um, because you may end up uh, creating a bond with these people and may find you know, more uh, interesting or, or different ways to travel um, if, if those people are available. So I, I would say maybe being entrepreneurial, um, just reducing the level of what it means to network and really just talking to people and letting them know what you're interested in um, and being open to, to talking to new people. I think, yeah. go ahead. Just to add on that particular one, if, uh, so just from a strictly early career perspective, I, I remember when I was a student and somebody told me you need to network. I was like, what networking even means? Like how how I how I should do it? like everybody's like you should network. It's like I'm not sure like if I understand the completely concept of networking. And for me, networking is about you know finding a way to collaborate instead of just kind of like meeting people, just finding that kind of like relationship with a person. And when you're a student, when you're early career, it's a little bit hard because you're still kind of like acquiring knowledge instead of kind of like being able to contribute something to other people. So I think the first part of that conversation when you're strictly early career is show interest, as Eva was mentioning. Just show interest, uh, real interesting. You know, I love what you're doing. I love your research. I love. Can you please, can you please tell me more? And then when you can always volunteer your time and say, hey, I want to learn more about what you're doing. And it's, it's kind of like I'm coming again to find the right mentor. And maybe when you're still doing that, uh, you might find the, the right advocate for you. And then we'll start sharing the networks with you. But that's kind of like just general advice for early career or even students. If we have some in the audience, I think that's what work for me. Uh, but yeah. Thanks for that. And then the last question is around <laughs> how to apply for the, the fellowship this year. So I will drop the link for that um, in the chat, as well as a link around um, an opportunity that I mentioned that I mentioned around engineering world health as an uh, not necessarily paid, but you don't have to pay opportunity. So first, this is for the fellowship, and then and this is for engineering world health. Um, 
So with that, that is all the questions we have. And, and before we jump the on, the, we on the on the on the E4C, how to apply, I know you're asking for a bit of guidelines. So please do refer to our social media. We're, we're trying to be a little more communicative in our social media. So you'll find a quick checklist of what you need to apply. Also in the web page, our newsletter. So we'll be in, we're sharing a lot of information through those um, channels. Uh, but basically we have a quick application form. It takes about 30 to 45 minutes to fill in and where, and feel, please feel free to kind of like explore our impact projects. So if you go to the pages that have been, that have been shared, you'll see all of the impact projects that we have for this year and some more are coming. So feel free to explore them and just kind of like fill that application form and you'll be ready to go. Uh, All right, um, so a final thank you to Ava and Shannon for being here. Um, thank you to our audience for, for the questions. They're definitely good and deep questions. And I think they, they really um, added something to the session and it's, and it's nice to have that engagement. Um, so we really appreciate you all for being here. Um, we hope you got something out of it. Uh, you have some nugget that you can take away for, for your career. Um, but I, I will just leave it to Ava and Shannon. Thank you. If, I don't know if you have any last words before we close out for the day. Maybe just thank you to EFC for organizing this panel discussion and to the audience for joining. We've had some fabulous questions, a few that have really made me think, but also uh, extended the discussion from the panel. And let's start the networking today. Um, LinkedIn, I love that Shannon mentioned that. Please connect with us. Uh, that That is step one, is just reaching the branch out. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And it was such a pleasure to uh, be here as a panelist. And yeah, feel free to reach out and connect. Stay curious, um, be self-reflective. And yeah, good things will always come your way. All right. Well, thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you as part of the Engineering for Change community, you know, commenting on articles on the website, um, applying for opportunities that, that interest you, um, and maybe at the, at the next webinar and certainly taking part in our social media. So um, thanks again for your time. We appreciate, we appreciate that and your engagement. So thanks. And we wish you good day, good morning, good evening, whatever may apply to you.